again. Okay, Dr. Donna Ott, take it away. Hi, welcome everybody. I'm so happy to be here today and to see so many of you. Um, we, I'm from Pennsylvania and we have currently a pretty significant problem with uh, smart meters, wireless utility meters that we've been working on a lot. And um, I learned out the hard, I learned the hard way myself when a meter was put on my own house against medical advice. And it was on for a long time, but transmitting very little until the metering program really took off. And when the other meters went in, that's when I really became very ill. And uh, <coughs> I've worked hard to recover as much as I can and try to use you know, what I have to be able to help others. We have many people in our home state here who had very similar symptoms and it's, it's really difficult. Um, we're always working on solutions and I'm so grateful for all of your work, Cece. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we all work together for the greater good and really happy to, to be here. We do. So Donna, tell us a little bit about your background. Hey, I'm a pediatric physical therapist by training and uh, my practice was in Philadelphia and I loved it there. It was really fun. Um, worked in natural settings. So I was in people's homes, um, playgrounds, the Franklin Institute, and uh, really enjoyed that. Um, and I think, you know, as a physical therapist too, that gives me a unique perspective about um, people's level of function and disability with respect to all of this. Yeah, and the disability issue is such a big word today. Um, and I know that at least up at the federal level, Libby Kelly and Sheena Symington, Magda Havis and um, Susie Malloy have been working very hard with the National Disabilities Council to get electromagnetic radiation addressed. So we're very grateful. And I'm so glad that you get to join us from uh, Pennsylvania today. And we'll spend about the next hour, hour and a half going through a set of slides that I have. And for everybody who's registered, we will go ahead and send you the recording of today's event as well as the slides so that as you start coming to terms with the wireless in your world, you can reference back and drill into the facts and perhaps share them with others. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and tee up my slides. Um, well, it would help if I did screen share first, right? <laughs> Hang on just one sec. Okay. All right, it'll just take a second for that to come up. And we will go into full screen mode here. Oh, I'm sorry, folks. Could you please mute yourselves? If you're not already. Thank you. Oh, my PC is tired today. It's coming, though. There we go. Okay, uh, Sydney, can you give me a nod if you can see my slides? All right, so thank you everybody. And again, um, Dr. Ott has a lot of credentials behind your name, including not only the doctor of physical therapy, but also functional medicine uh, training as well. So we're so honored to have her with us today. And she will be with us again on the 22nd at 6 p.m. So anybody who wants to come back and keep learning with us, you're more than welcome. So that MTPW after my name just means I had the privilege of earning a master's of technical and professional writing from Northeastern University, where I also earned my undergrad in communication. And I never, ever would have thought that this is where I'd be using that skill set, but I'm very grateful to have it. Um, and I use my writing and my speaking and my work all the time. So the way that I fell down the rabbit hole with this issue is... I used to run our local education foundation here in Ashland, Massachusetts, at the time when the industry was bringing forth their uh, 21st century classroom. And so the messaging we were getting is that you're going to fall behind if you don't have all this technology in your schools. So our school budget was cut to the bone year after year, and we simply didn't have funding to bring all this new tech in. So, you know, good to be parents. We jumped in and started doing fundraising. We got wireless infrastructure. We got iPads and Chromebooks and smart boards and minis and Apple TV and all what we thought was gonna give our kids a leg up. 
And then one night at my book group, my girlfriend, Wendy, who's an electrical engineer, was reading a book called Zapped by Anne Louise Gittleman. And she was telling us that it looks like there are biological effects from today's wireless tech. And, you know, it was book group and that wasn't the book we were reading that night. So I just made a mental note of it. And then not long after that, I saw something else that was indicating that wireless tech is not biologically safe. So being a tech writer, I just thought, huh, I wonder if there's really any science to this. So I started looking for the peer-reviewed, independent, published science. And I will tell you, I was just gobsmacked that there are literally thousands of studies all over the world showing extensive biological harm. And we will be going into the science with you in just a few minutes. So I raised my hand at my schools and said, hey guys, I think we have a problem here. And I thought they would have evacuated the building and fixed it before they let those kids back in the building, like if we had a gas leak in the science lab. But no, I got back crickets, crickets, you know, zilch. And come to find out that the wireless industry had penetrated at the state level. They had gone to the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and they had sold them on this 21st century classroom, and they embedded it into the curriculum. So when we started saying, guys, I think there's something wrong with wireless here, our school committee, our administrators, the school, everyone's looking at us like deer in the headlights because they have now embedded all of this technology into the curriculum. And if you get a low review at the state level, that can impact your funding and your very job. So it was not an easy conversation at all to have with our schools, but one of our school committee members who had been our former chair, she went and looked at the federal level to see who the top lobbyists are. And there was a list of a hundred of them and it was just riddled with telecom and wireless and utility companies and high tech. So she could see where there are conflicts of interest where perhaps we're not being given the full story. Um, so we wound up becoming the first in the United States to even have this little sign hanging in our classrooms with best practices for mobile devices turn off these devices when we're not using them and turn on the Wi-Fi only when it's needed. Let's not leave these wireless access points pulsing 24 seven. We hear time and time again of children and teachers getting injured from those very strong microwave radiation emissions. And then always place the device on a solid surface, not your body. And when I was a little girl, even with the television sets that we had, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, those throw off an electric and magnetic field that's stronger than our own body's electromagnetic field. So I can still hear my mom saying, stand back from the TV, you know, because every little kid goes right up to it, right? Stand back from the TV. So I knew a little bit that these man-made energies could be harmful, but boy, wait till you see the science. So we became the first in the US to even have this little sign hanging in our classrooms. And then knowing that I brought this into my schools, I'm like, well, that's not good enough because they're just sitting there with a sign in the classrooms, but they're not actually doing it. So I went to Senator Karen Spilka, who's my legislator here in Ashland, Massachusetts. And I met with her and I showed her the science I showed her Ashlyn's little sign, and then I measured the radiation coming off of her cell phone and her district director's laptop, and both devices went right off the charts into the red zone. And Senator Spilka's looking at me like, really? And I said, yes, and nobody knows. This is a right to know issue, just like with alcohol or tobacco or gambling or pornography or drugs, adults will make the choices they make, but we all deserve a right to know of the risks and we are morally obligated to protect our children. So Senator Spilka put me with an attorney in her office and together we crafted a very simple bill that would just bring the right minds together at the state level, form a commission and investigate and then decide what to do. And then, so we've had that bill in various forms in Massachusetts for eight years now. And we had the same conversation with a state representative, Patrick Abrami in New Hampshire. And within seven months, we got a bill passed into law to investigate. And we'll teach you more about that New Hampshire 
activity in a little bit. So on this journey, uh, Dr. Deborah Davis, who founded the Environmental Health Trust, she's a Nobel Peace Prize co-laureate on climate change and one of our country's leading scientists and an international expert on the wireless radiation issue. She found my work here with the schools, what we're doing with our legislature, and she reached out and said, hey, there's this group in the UK that's working on getting education out to the public. So she put me in touch with Brett and Lynn West in the UK, and Brett was stymied. He is in technology. And his career at that time was to put wireless systems in huge construction projects in the UK. And then along came this notice from the American Academy of Pediatrics. These are the doctors who get the conundrum cases that regular doctors haven't been trained on. The American Academy of Environmental Medicine, I'm sorry if I said pediatrics, it's the American Academy of Environmental Medicine they put out a position statement, I think it was back in 2012, to school superintendents saying, please do not put wireless in the schools. Stay with safe, hardwired technology. So Brett gets this and he's like, what is this? So he starts doing his investigation. He sees all the science and he's a tech guy. So he's like, well, I'll just spin up a side business and help people to fix this. And he quickly realized you can't fix it because nobody even knows the problem exists. So we've got to get the education out there first. And so I was so honored that they reached out to me and to Dr. Miko Ahonen out of Finland, who's one of the world's leading scientists on these man-made energies. And so Brett and Lynn and Miko and I, we hit it hard for about six months and we came up with a little course that will train an entire school district in about a half an hour online. We can use it to train your companies. We can use it to train your families or your municipality. So there's no reason not to address this today. We have everything we need. So that's our little nonprofit wireless education. And then when, um, when we had our bills, the first go around here in Massachusetts, Dr. Deborah Davis of the Environmental Health Trust organized an international team to come to the Massachusetts State House to ask that we support this right to know legislation. And she brought with her the retired president of Microsoft Canada, Frank Clegg. So I'm sitting there at the State House at this panel going, wow, we've got a world leading scientist. We've got a captain of industry. And then she brought in Dr. R.S. Sharma from India and it was his job in the Indian government to recommend public radiation exposure limits. And India's used to be way up here where the US and Canada and certain other countries still are. India took it down 90%, at least on paper. They're still figuring out how to implement it, but that showed that with some political will, we can absolutely start fixing this. Um, so, there was also Janet Newton from the EMR Institute. Uh, she had been very active for years. I think her husband was injured. He might have been one of the guys who goes up on rooftops, maybe for HVAC or to administer to the cell towers. And people are getting very sick at these close range exposures. And then we also had Dr. Catherine Steiner Adair, who's an internationally renowned um, child psychologist and she came to tell us that our children are not developing on point anymore. Where math and science are housed in the brain, those seem to be still coming along, but the whole other part where we develop as proper humans is really taking a hit. She said kids should not be in front of these screens to the extent that they are. They should be outside playing in nature going into deeper and deeper and deeper levels of imaginative play. And that is how we grow a proper child, not in the shallows of a screen. They need physical activity. They need connection to nature. They need movement. They need to have connections with their peers and trusted adults. So today's message is certainly not no technology because we couldn't even be together today without it. But the message is safe and responsible technology. And we're gonna give you a lot of tips on how to do that. So when I was at the State House for this incredible 
international forum and met Dr. Davis and Frank Clegg from Microsoft Canada and all the others. I met a whole bunch of citizens. It was a standing room only forum. And up until that point, I was the only person I knew who could talk about this. And, you know, 10 years ago, I wasn't even really sure what I knew. So it was so gratifying to be sitting there listening to world leaders warning us about wireless radiation, and then to connect with a whole bunch of other citizens that I didn't know existed who already knew about this issue. So we eventually formed Massachusetts for Safe Technology. And as I said, we'll be sending you my slides, we'll be sending you the recording of this. So anywhere we've got the blue underline, drill down and look at things for yourself. Our websites, both Donna's and mine, both have a lot of really helpful information. And we tell people, don't take our word on this. Know it for yourself. And so if anything we've put together to help you connect the dots quickly can help you move along in the learning curve on this, by all means, you know, reuse, re recycle, re whatever you can do to come up to speed. So then somebody found my work down at the National Institutes of Health, and there was this Health in Buildings Roundtable Conference coming up. And they reached out to me and said, would you be so kind as to co-chair our technology panel? And I said, well, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. And they said, that's OK. We like the way you present information. And I said, OK. And I think that goes to my wonderful family. I'm the youngest of 10 kids. So using my voice was a survival skill. <laughs> so um, I'm grateful that I have a skill set that can be used. But this link here will help you to bring almost instant credibility to this issue. I was so honored that Frank Clegg from Microsoft Canada, he's retired, he flew down and served on our panel and told everybody that their industry can absolutely do better if given a nudge. And he's up in Canada trying to do with Parliament what we've been trying to do here, and that's to protect the public. We had Dr. Martin Paul, who's one of the world's leading scientists, he told us all these mechanisms of harm because for years the industry would say, oh, there's no mechanism of harm identified in the science. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. Well, Dr. Paul talks us through that and I will talk you through that today too. We had Theodora Scarato, the executive director of the Environmental Health Trust, and she brought in the expertise from around the world and showed that other schools and other towns and other states and countries are way ahead of us where we have all the industry here in the US. Um, and then we had Peter Sullivan, and I found Peter Sullivan's work. Uh, he has a nonprofit called Clearlight Ventures, and he has two sons who, around the preschool years, fell into the autism spectrum. And I had listened to a talk that Peter gave online, and he was saying that with his sons, he did what most parents will do when they start tuning in to cleaning up the environment. He got them to a clean organic diet. He went so far as to do the heavy metal detox to get all that pollution out of the brain and the body. And he said, today, I advise that immediately do a digital detox. Um, folks, could I ask you to please mute? Thank you. So Peter did this digital detox with his kids and Peter himself had gotten ill from electromagnetic radiation. He had been a fighter pilot like Top Gun. And so he was up off the earth, way up high where the electromagnetic energy is much higher inside of a plane that has radar on it, sitting in the cockpit with all this instrumentation that also has a whole bunch of electromagnetic fields. So Peter's health started crashing and he started investigating. And, you know, he grew up to be a Silicon Valley um, engineer. So it was like his friends who created cell phones and other accoutrements that we now know today need to be used very carefully. Cece, I'm sorry, I think I, I think I muted you by accident. So. Thank you, I'm sorry. Okay, that's okay. Thank you, Donna, I appreciate your co-hosting. There's a lot of uh, Wizard of Oz stuff happening behind the scenes that you're taking care of, so I'm grateful. 
Um, so anyway, back to Peter Sullivan. So his health started crashing. He lost excessive weight to an unhealthy point. His teeth started getting very brittle. So he looked into it. And then when his kids were on the autism spectrum, both of his sons, he really got down to business on this. So what I learned from Peter is that there's something called de novo mutations, which means the autism did not come from mom's genealogy. It did not come from dad's bloodline. It came from somewhere in the environment. And if you clean up the environment, very often you see incredible, remarkable recovery. And we don't want to overpromise because each one of us is very different biologically, but we see huge improvements. And today, both of Peter's sons are grown men and neither one of them is on the autism spectrum anymore. And I didn't even know that was an option. So I was so grateful that Peter joined us at the Health and Buildings Roundtable Conference too. And I just, uh, last note on that one is that all of our talks were limited to 10 minutes. So you'll get to hear from all these experts very quickly. And it's a wonderful link to share with others when you're bringing them into this important conversation. And then one of the major gaps we had when I fell down the rabbit hole back in 2013 is that we could tell so many people were developing these sickness symptoms that aligned with what we know today about this alphabet soup. So let's go through the alphabet soup. EMF stands for electromagnetic fields. Now the earth pulses its own electromagnetic field. We have our own electromagnetic field and we're meant to be synchronized with the earth's electromagnetic field. So that pulses this beautiful healing energy 7.83 times per second. That's something that a scientist named Schumann figured out, and it's called Schumann's resonance. So about eight times a second, pulsing beautiful healing energy. Well, we got so fancy with our digital technology that today we are getting electromagnetic fields of radio frequency radiation or microwave radiation that pulsates at us in the megahertz range, that means in one second, there's 1 million jackhammerings of microwave radiation at us. In the gigahertz range, it's 1 billion times per second, this jackhammering of microwaves at us. So it's all the same, these electromagnetic fields, radio frequency radiation, microwave radiation, it's all what we've done to ourselves by letting the industry talk us into all Wi-Fi all the time. So we are so grateful that back in 2019, with great thanks to Dr. Lynn Patrick, we had the first EMF medical conference here in the U.S. And then with blessings from Elizabeth or Libby Kelly, uh, she has been working on this issue with ADA for many years she took on this ginormous task of pulling together the next medical conference, and that was EMF Medical Conference 2021. Now, last July, the opportunity to earn 24.5 continuing medical education credits plus CEs for nurses, that CME opportunity expired in July, but Libby went through the hoops and got this entire medical conference put online at no charge. So you can go train with world leading experts and you can bring this to your own healthcare practitioners, your doctors, your nurses, your physical therapists, your naturopaths, all of them should be learning about this and the opportunity is here for free. And I was so honored to be asked to help plan that conference. And also I was, um, one of the CME speakers on state and local policy. So please, all of these talks at the conference were from maybe 18 minutes to a half an hour to maybe an hour. And all the Q&A panels, all of it is there for you to enjoy for free. So some people will just start taking each one of those videos and plugging them into their calendar every day, do like a half an hour. And within you know a couple of weeks, you will have top-notch education on this. So that's my story. That's how I got involved in this crazy issue that never in a million years did I imagine I'd be here talking to you guys about, but here we are. Hey, Cece. Yes. Hi, it's Eileen. Hi, Eileen. I'm on my phone, so it's a little weird to, to, to navigate, but um, 
So can you just repeat that? The earth is 7.8 uh, per second, but what, what, what's the, is it gigahertz you said? Gigahertz is a billion times a second. And no, but what's seven, what's, what's 7.8? What, what would you call seven, that? 7.83 is Schumann's resonance. That's okay. the earth. Okay. But what is that? What is that according to in frequency terms? What is that? Hertz, 7.83 Hertz. That's what I meant. Hertz. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. And then, Thanks. so then, so then we're dealing with 1 million per second gigahertz, you're saying? Megahertz. Or megahertz. Okay. Yeah. Giga means billion. Mega means million. Uh, great question. Okay. I mean. okay. The other question I have is, so cell towers, according to the FCC, Mm -hmm. are allowed to go from 300 khz which i don't know what it stands for kilohertz. to 100 ki oh, kilohertz what is that I how think many that's a thousand times a second a thousand times a second okay to 100 gigahertz right ghz it says yeah so now is that per antenna or is that the aggregate I don't think they're aggregating anything, um, but you'd probably be best off speaking to one of the building biologists on that technical level um, or one of the attorneys. So we'll-, well But if you, if you ask your town, so what's the signal strength that's coming out of that cell tower? Mm -hmm. I want to know what the answer is when they give it to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like, is no, it no, over? you're asking great questions. Okay. Um, yeah, it's overpowering, really. All of it is very overpowering. And our yeah. biological systems and our environment are not built for this. Right. So we, we do what we do. We educate and then we get active in our communities. And Eileen, I know I'm so grateful you brought me in to educate in your town. Um, and we were lucky you had a select board member there who was around when they first built those bylaws and did put some restrictions in. So in a way, yeah. you're a bit ahead yeah. of your town. Yeah. All right. Um, let me keep cruising on with the slides. Okay. We'll be okay. doing a Q and A at the end. Okay. Okay. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to drop them into the chat as well. And uh, Donna will help us to get through those at the end. So. Okay. Okay. Thank All you. Right. You're welcome, hon. So anybody who has an iPhone, I invite you to take that out right now, and I want to show you something that's going to make it a little easier for you to open this conversation with others. If you don't have an iPhone, that's okay. This information is contained in all of the phones. You can just search on your own phones, make and model, and then type in RF exposure and you'll be able to find it. So the legal fine print, uh, there is a website called See the Fine Print that our friends at the Environmental Health Trust put up and they've got disclaimers on a lot of the equipment. Um, this one, for example, was in the... Uh, Ooh, the Apple iPads, seizures, blackouts, eye strain, and what parent out there knows about this, right? Okay, so from your iPhone, go into settings and a little ways down, hit general. From general, go all the way down to legal and regulatory and hit that. And on the next screen, you see RF exposure. That's radio frequency, microwave radiation, uh, that they politely call energy. So settings, general, legal and regulatory, and then RF exposure. And when we read that legal fine print, it tells us a couple of really important things. One, this device was tested at a distance from the body. So if you're holding it, if you're putting it in your bra or your shirt pocket or your suit pocket, or you're tucking it in your yoga pants or your back pocket, you are exceeding the Federal Communications Commission's guidelines, they're not even standards, they're just guidelines for microwave radiation. And then we should also note, and we'll cover this in a little bit, the FCC has now been sued for ignoring 11,000 pages of evidence of harm, and they have completely blown off the court order to bring the science and public policy in line. So you read a little further down there and it says to reduce your exposure, basically don't touch something that's radiating. It says use a hands-free option like a headset. Um, folks, can you please mute? I'm hearing a little rustling in the background. So um, yeah, it's distracting. Um, 
So it tells you not to touch a radiating device. And that legal fine print has been in there all along. And, you know, for every problem that we've created, we have solutions. I'm going to stop my screen share for a second, and I'm going to go ahead and spotlight myself so I can show you a couple things. So we just did with Sarah Amanoff, who I think has joined us today. We were just invited to do an interview this week about the ear pods or the air pods or the wireless headsets. Those emit a tremendous amount of radiation right up to the brain. So for everything we've broken, we know how to fix it. For the headsets, look for something called a hollow tube or an air tube headset. So this you'll see just has rubber tips. There's no metal because one of the properties of this radiation is that it amplifies with metal. So if you're putting metal right up to your brain, it's going to draw in not only what's coming directly from your device, but all the ambient radiation too. So you don't want to be putting anything metal up to your head that's radiating. And then it comes down to these little ferrite beads that break the radiation off of the metal wire here. So it does have a metal wire with a nice long cord. So you can set your device far away from you. And it's got acoustics, muting and volume and all of that, but it only has rubber up to your brain. So um, the Centers for Disease Control has something called the Alara Principle. The goal is to get to as low as reasonably achievable. That's the Alara Principle. And our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention tells us when we're dealing with radiation, you wanna think about three areas. One, reduce the time that you're radiating yourself as much as you can. So time, create as much distance from a radiating anything as you can. And third, if you can't get away from it, shield. And there are professionals who are trained to help you get this shielding right. You wanna be very careful because there are some caveats. If you wind up creating a Faraday cage effect and then somebody comes into your space with something that's radiating, those signals are just gonna bounce off and you're gonna get whammied in there. So shield very carefully. Um, and uh, for the chat, it was, uh, you wanna look for hollow tube or air tube headsets. And there are some um, credible companies out there. If anybody's telling you that any device is gonna be a fix all, be end all to, to keep you safe, be very, very wary. Anybody who knows their stuff will tell you the first line of defense is to get rid of the radiation. We can't kid ourselves. There is no safe level of man-made radiation in the scientific literature. So if they're saying, you know, they're going to give you some device or gadget and everything's going to be fine, be very careful. The folks who really know their stuff will say, first line of defense is remove the radiation. And then if you have to use something that's radiating, here are some products you can consider. So we know that... Um, Tech Wellness is reputable. Uh, Shield Your Body is reputable. Um, LessEMF.com is reputable. And there may be others out there, but we know we've had wonderful interactions and good feedback from customers there. So look for the hollow tube or the air tube headsets. So um, let me give you a demonstration because I had a really hard time getting my head around invisible toxins, kind of like the pandemic, right? And now we know we need to be vigilant with anything that's exposing us that we can't see, hear, smell, taste, but many can feel these frequencies once they learn to connect the dots to what their symptoms are. So at the EMF medical conference, this was the meter that was recommended to doctors to put into their practice. And one of the doctors here up on the North Shore of Massachusetts, she bought one and she loans it to her patients for $10. So they take it seriously and they share the cost and says, you've got two hours, go home, measure, jot down where your exposures are and come on back and we'll teach you how to use it safely. So that's Dr. Aaron Acevedo up in Beverly, Massachusetts. So let me show you how this works. In my home, after I stopped circling my tail and really decided, hey, I'm the mom, it's my job to protect my family, 
I got rid of as much of the wireless as I could. And honestly, you guys, this is not rocket science to fix with the things that you have control over. Getting your mind shit, my, your mindset shifted is probably the hardest thing. So that's why we encourage you, do your research. The more information you have, the more empowered you are to take meaningful change. Um, hang on, Donna dropped off. I got to let her back in. So here in my house, you see that it's at the green level. And I'll tell you what the measurement is. It's at two microwatts per square meter. So that just means within like three feet of air, how much radiation is there? Two is what I've gotten my house down to. But I now want to show you what happens when I take my cell phone out of airplane mode, which is my default because I just simply forward my cell phone to my landline. There's something in your settings that allows you to do that. And if you got rid of your landline, you might reconsider. Maybe it's worth the 20 bucks a month to get it back. Um, and everybody in my world knows I don't use a cell phone except for emergencies. And so I've got them all trained to either call my landline or hit me up through my hardwired computer. So here's, here's, here's what happens <laughs> with a radiating cell phone as all these antennas come online. So see how we were in the nice oops, green on this before? We're now in the flashing red, which is the absolute worst. Um, so I'm going to come out of airplane mode. Holy moly. Uh, hang on, I'm going to put my phone back into airplane mode. Woo. All right, see how it dissipates and it drops back off. So I'm safe again. We were at two microwatts per square meter. We went to 1,370,000 microwatts per square meter. Over a million and you know what the science wants us to be at? 10 or less in our indoor sleeping environments. And probably no more than 100 indoors in other indoor environments. So that's how bad this is. We want to be at 10. When that cell phone came online, it had a cellular and a data antenna that started radiating. We don't know it, but there are many different antennas inside this one device, and they're all given to us full tilt. So with just a little education, we can say, well, I'm not using Bluetooth. Why is that on? I'm not using Wi-Fi. Why is that on? I'm not using locator or hotspot or 5G. Why do I have these antennas radiating? So again, we want to get to as low as reasonably achievable. So keep peeling it back until you get to as safe as a of a level as you can get to. Okay, I'm going to go back to my screen share. And um, when I learned that there were scientific instruments that would help us to measure this, I went after a grant in my town because I knew that we had a little pot of money that get, got distributed through community um, projects. So I put in my application and the first time around they said, ah, oh, gee, we don't really know about this. Come back next time. So the second time around, I went back to our select board and I put in my application and they said, well, gee, hmm, this is probably more of a board of health issue. So they lobbed it over to the board of health. And I had already met with our health director in Ashland and he was around back in the nineties when the industry literally wined and dined our municipal leaders, like took them to big fancy hotels and said, hey, isn't this great? We're bringing cell towers to your town. And if anybody brought up the health effects, they said, gee, we're sorry, but you know, the um, Telecom Act of 1996 says, if there's any, any concern over environmental effects, psh, you can't sue us. So there was no legal recourse is what they told our towns. So I knew that our Board of Health um, really didn't have a good grasp on this. There is actually much that our towns can do. Your hands are not tied. You may have one finger tied, but you got nine others. And with a good attorney who understands telecom law, most of our town attorneys don't. So it's important to hire somebody who does. And we'll give you some leads for that later. Um, 
you can write zoning bylaws for your town that will give a lot of protection instead of just letting the industry come in and steamroll all over you. Because if your zoning bylaws don't protect you, then you have no legal foot to stand on. So we began educating my town and I met with our select board members one by one by one by one. And I showed them the radiation, some in their homes, some in my home, some we met in a coffee shop. And then it wasn't until I had testified at the state house here on the bill to form a commission that I realized this really does take a one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, because the industry has gotten so far ahead of us deploying the big tobacco playbook. If you can suppress the evidence of harm, if you can promote the benefits of your product, if you can suppress, you know, or do studies under your own criteria that deliberately show no harm. And if you've got deep pockets and can commandeer our, you know, legislators, then they get their way. So they got a big head start on us. So it was no small task. It took me three tries to get this meter in our public library. I had to go to the board at the library as well and present to the trustees and they voted four to one to put an RF meter on loan in our public library. And now we're finding out that a lot of libraries are doing this. So I'm so great that it's taken off. And um, the in 2016, this was the meter that I put in. It's on par with the Safe and Sound Pro 2. I would probably recommend the Safe and Sound Pro 2 today because it's got a plug in it. And for people who are electrically sensitive, you can plug it into the wall and just let it be on so that if somebody comes into your space, you'll catch them right away and say, please turn off your antennas. Um, so this is something that any of us can do in our towns. Most of our libraries are now doing libraries of things. And, you know, it's not the old days where people just came to the library to get a book because people are accessing their books in different ways using their electronics. So uh, most libraries are investing in libraries of things to bring people back together in the community. And it's not a stretch anymore to ask your library to please put a radio frequency detection meter on loan. And I would be happy to send you some more information on that. If your library has no budget or only has partial budget, I understand that the Environmental Health Trust has a small grant fund. And if your librarian reaches out to them, it can't be the citizens, it's got to be the librarian. But if your librarian reaches out, they may well be able to help fund an RF meter for your library. So again, solutions abound. As freaky as this issue is, we know how to fix it. Um, so what we know now is that many years ago, we had independent journalistic reporting. And then our mainstream media channels got bought up and bought up and bought up. And what we're left with today is the same four to six major conglomerations that own a lot of these industries like telecom. They bought up all of our mainstream media so they control the messaging. So it's really hard to see any independent reporting on this topic. And that's why we're so grateful to our local cable stations because they are perhaps one of the last bastions of independent reporting in our communities. And I was so honored when WACA TV in my town sent resources to my home and helped me do this 23 minute public service announcement. And it's so cool. It's gotten more than 10,000 views. So to think that that little tiny video showing the exposures in one's home and what to do about it has already maybe helped 10,000 people. That's pretty cool. And then more recently, the executive director of WCCA-TV in Worcester, Massachusetts, reached out and he'd had me on his programs a time or two with Patricia Burke, who's another incredible advocate here in Massachusetts. And he just finally said, Cece, you just should have your own show. So they invite me into the studio every two weeks and we do this Tech Safe series. And our co-host today, Donna Ott, was my guest recently, and we now have a half hour episode of her telling more about what's going on in Pennsylvania. And that link is included on the last slide in this series today. So lots of good information. If you have a story to tell and you're not camera shy, please reach out. We'd love to help you bring your story forward. All right, so again, don't take our word on any of this. Let's look at the science. 
First, we'll look at the long-term effects, and on the next slide, we'll look at the short-term effects. So for years, the industry spun it that this, oh, there's no mechanism of harm identified in the science. Well, about 20 years ago, the science was mounting, and it was looking like this was starting to be very dangerous. And so uh, it was brought to the attention of the Food and Drug Administration here in the United States, and they commissioned a study to see if cell phones could be harmful. And they spent 20 years investigating and we're not allowed to do studies like this on humans. So we use rodents and the sprague dowley rats and some of the mice show us in many arenas with toxicity that what happens to these particular animals happens to us as well. So that's why we use those. And they, had an unprecedented three-day peer review at the National Institutes of Health with world-leading scientists and doctors whose life's work is this radio frequency microwave radiation. And at the end of the day, they released their final report that determined clear evidence of cancerous tumors and DNA damage, among other findings. Clear evidence. That's the highest of five categories they can assign is clear evidence. Well, you know, anytime something good happens, the industry will grab it and spin it and say, oh, that's just one study. You need to have more than one corroboration, whatever. Well, right on the heels of our major $30 million study, the Ramazzini Institute in Italy completed another large study, not on the cell phones like we did, but on the cell tower base stations where all those antennas are mounted. And guess what they found? DNA damage, cancers, and everything else that we found. So it doesn't matter where this radiation is coming from. It's the radiation itself that is damaging us and every biological cell. Um, so child and adult cancers are on the rise. Uh, the industry will tell you cancer rates are going down. Well, that's because we address tobacco. But if you look at specific cancers, like where do we put our devices? Colon and rectal cancers are doubling and quadrupling. We're seeing breast cancers in men and women. Um, and the acoustic neuromas and the glioblastomas and you know the thyroid cancers. So this is happening in real time. And as we know, DNA is the roadmap to grow a proper anything and this is damaging the DNA. So it was actually when I started reading the infertility studies that I found my voice on this issue. They have taken male human sperm, exposed it to a laptop with the antennas radiating, and it changed the DNA, it slowed the motility, and it caused far fewer sperm to be viable or apoptosis or programmed cell death that was killing the sperm in four hours of exposure. And that was my aha moment. I thought, oh, mercy. We had just sent our oldest daughter off to college with her MacBook. Our youngest had just gone into high school. And for Christmas, we gave her a laptop thinking we'd give her a leg up and wear both my girls using them, but right on top of their reproductive organs. And we now have many studies on women's reproduction. Kaiser Permanente came out with another one a really good study that shows that women who are using wireless technology are having higher miscarriage rates. So when I figured this chunk out, I thought, wow, I cannot sit still on this. I brought it into my schools, folks. We got to get this addressed. And then as we know, we are at epidemic levels as a society in all of our industrialized nations anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation like we've never seen before among adults and children, ADD, ADHD, autism, Alzheimer's, and the list just goes on. We cannot continue to pollute the environment of the brain and expect that things are going to be just hunky-dory. So with the ADHD, ADD, ADHD, Dr. Hugh Taylor runs the OBGYN program at Yale Medical School, and he has performed the rodent studies where they expose the pregnant mice uh, to cell phones for, I think, maybe, I don't know, nine hours per day. And those little mamas gave birth to the pups. And before long, these pups were just bouncing off the walls 
not a care in the world, no focus, a lot like a child who's having attention deficit hyperactivity disorders. Dr. Martha Herbert founded the Autism Research Lab at Massachusetts General Hospital, and she sees huge connections between the families in her care and what we know happens when we expose ourselves and our children to microwave radiation. Dr. Martin Paul combed the science on this, and he came out with a really good paper that shows, and many other studies show, that Alzheimer's, which used to take, like cancer, decades to surface, Alzheimer's used to be in our 70s, 80s, 90s. We're now seeing it in our 60s, our 50s, our 40s, our 30s, and even in rare cases in our 20s. So we can't just keep microwaving the brain and have normal results. So we are always so grateful when mainstream groups do start taking this issue on, like the Environmental Working Group. And many of you may recognize their Clean 15 and Dirty Dozen lists that they put out every year on pesticides and our foods. Which produce should you try to get organic if you can? and which is not quite so bad if it's grown conventionally because the part you eat is protected from the chemicals that they're grown with. So I knew about EWG and boy, I'll tell you, I am so grateful they have gotten funding to put a PhD scientist on this who's putting out fact sheets like protecting kids from wireless at home and at school. And then they've got another one over here on neurotoxicity. So, the information is there, it is easily accessible. We just need to take the time to come up to speed and find the courage to go against the tide. And folks, our kids, 50% have 50% plus now have chronic illnesses. This doesn't happen for no reason. So when we look at the work of Dr. Om Gandhi and his colleagues who did the modeling on the absorption into the brain of microwave radiation, when you put a cell phone up to the ear, these head models are turned sideways. The yellow dot is the ear. And on you and I, if you're willing to put a phone up to your brain, it's going to penetrate your brain about a third of the way through. On a 10-year-old child, whose skull is thinner and whose brain has a higher water content that helps to amplify the radiation. It's going almost three quarters of the way through this 10 year old's brain. And on a five year old child, this radiation is going into the child's almost entire brain. So we really need to understand what these technologies are doing and learn to make safer choices. And we'll walk you through a lot of that. Um, so yeah, we got to protect our kiddos. So the short-term effects, and you know, kind of good news here is that after one of these education sessions, people will come back to me again and again and say, you know what, Cece, I did not want to know this. I didn't want to hear it because my gosh, I live on my device, but I recognized a bunch of these symptoms. So I took a chance. Didn't cost me anything. All I had to do was turn this stuff off at night. And my body could begin to cell repair and regenerate again. So we should know that for about 20 years, the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Jobs Area Network and all these other you know, groups under the ADA have long since recognized these electromagnetic sensitivities. So it may be the first time you or others you open the conversation with hear about this, but please know people have been working on this for a long time. Insomnia is a huge one. You know, sleeping is what children and teenagers have always done best. And now we have kids who don't sleep anymore. And now we've given every child a wireless device. During the pandemic, we issued everybody an iPad or a Chromebook with no safety instruction. And what we now know scientifically is that the brain perceives these man-made energies as a light energy form. And we are light beings. We operate off of light and dark with our 24-hour circadian rhythm. During the wee hours of darkness, the brain would normally, from the pineal gland, release melatonin that goes in and regulates our sleep. 
and helps to do the cell repair and cleanup from everyday toxins. Well, what happens when we leave these microwaves pulsing is the brain thinks the lights are on and it's waiting for darkness to release the melatonin. So if we don't clear this stuff out, especially of our sleeping areas, then we can be setting ourselves up for a domino effect because it's cumulative. You might feel great today, but tomorrow may be the day that you fall over the cliff and all of a sudden you start getting all these unseemingly unrelated wackadoodle symptoms. So people aren't sleeping right. Headaches, stabbing, searing headaches, migraines that your doctors can't help you figure out nosebleeds or even ear bleeds, chronic fatigue, pain from unidentified sources. Um, so another mechanism of harm, aside from the melatonin, aside from the cancer, aside from the infertility, we now know what this is doing to our blood. So our red blood cells are meant to be free floating, bringing oxygen up to all of our systems and organs. That's how we live. When we expose ourselves to electromagnetic fields, it's causing those red blood cells to deform. That's bad enough. They start looking like uh, bottle caps instead of these nice little round or oval bits of blood. And then with that magnetic field, guess what? They start glomming onto each other. And so now you have this series of red blood cells stuck together in a chain that can't get to where they need to bring the oxygen. And that's called the Rouleau effect. And in my little brain, I liken that to the candy Rolos. Remember the chocolate caramels? That long stack of chocolate caramels? That's kind of what our blood's doing. And then we can't oxygenate our systems. And so in the medical field, they call that oxidative stress, reactive oxygen species, um, it does all sorts of nasty things. And so the foundation for most chronic illness is oxidative stress. So just by learning about this and taking baby steps, we can have huge improvements in our health. So another thing that we've learned through the science is that the surface of our skin helps us to navigate our world, right? We've got like little antennas in the surface of our skin and they can get very easily overpowered by this bombardment of microwave radiation. So some people talk about getting the hot ear from having the cell phone up to their head. Others will talk about tingling. I know for me, my tell is that my pinky finger starts to get numb, starts to tingle on me. Um, and other people talk about itching, facial flushing, skin rashes, uh, nerves that start going jiggity if you keep it in your pockets. So our body's trying to tell us something's not right here. We just need to learn how to listen. And then another one of our beautiful organs here is the heart. And we talked about how fast these microwave pulsations are coming at us. It's really hard for our organs to keep up with that. So for some people, it might make your heartbeat go too fast or too slow um, or blood pressure that goes wacky. So cognitive impairment, boy, you know, a lot of people just can't think straight anymore, but you remove these exposures, give our bodies a chance to heal. And a lot of that comes a lot better too. And it was just heartbreaking at the EMF medical conference to hear doctors telling us that if we don't get ahead of this, we are biologically changing the gray matter and the white matter of the brain, even in the areas where we would normally make wise decisions. So if we're changing the structure of the brain, we can expect to see many more of these outbursts in our society, like we have been seeing with the mass shootings and other non-favorable behaviors. When Massachusetts children went back to school, I saw three different reports on the local news of children who have lost their minds, and they are literally beating their classmates with their Chromebook. And that was in three different school districts, so I'd imagine it's probably happening elsewhere. We can't keep radiating the brain and expect our kids to survive it normally. And I mentioned that to a, a woman I met at my gym, and she works for the high school in Framingham, and she said, oh my gosh, one of my colleagues is out on disability because one of the kids beat her up with his tablet. So 
we got to get ahead of this, folks. And there's no cavalry coming. It's for you and I to learn about this and do what we can from where we are. And like I said, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation is growing and growing. Let's see what happens when we remove the radiation. And it's not just you and I, it's every biological cell on the planet is impacted by these microwaves. <clears throat> so um, there is a new website that Environmental Health Trust just launched recently called Wildlife, Wireless, and the Environment. This would be a lovely resource to take to your sustainability committee, to your conservation committee in your town, and let's start learning together. And what you'll find is that, you know how I talked about, we have our little antennas in our skin to tell us when it's too hot or too cold. And, you know, it helps us navigate our world. Well, our pollinators and our birds and our bee, you know, all of them, they have their own systems built in. Maybe it's magnetite in the beaks or other, you know, built-ins that keep them synchronized to the Earth's electromagnetic field. And that's how they get around. That's how they find their way back to the hives and the nests and, and do all the beautiful things they do for us and our food and keep our environments pretty clean. Well, what happens when we blast them with this invisible layer of electropollution? Well, we see pollinators disappearing. We see birds dropping dead out of the sky or stunned when they get hit with these um, microwaves. And then they can't get back to where they need to be. Um, and for anybody who's concerned about climate change, as far back as 2012, one of the Greenpeace analysts took a look at how much energy the technology sector is using and said, if the cloud were a country, and this is back in 2012, it would be the fifth largest consumer of energy in the world. And look at what we've done in the more recent dozen years where we've just brought so much more into our world. You probably don't even wanna know about the human atrocities that are going on to get all of the minerals. There are dozens of minerals in each one of our devices that are taken at the toll of human harms down in the Congo and elsewhere. Uh, all of the data warehouses, all of the networks, all of our personal devices are continuously using energy in the background that we don't even think about. Every time we do streaming, that uses a huge amount. So let's not stream live anymore. Let's download it onto our device and then put the airplane mode on and turn off all those antennas. Every time we send and receive, maybe with a little education, we'll be a bit more judicious and we won't just sit there thumbing around on our phones all day because we got nothing better to do, maybe we'll stop doing that and save ourselves some energy. Charging and recharging and recharging all of our devices all of the time. Folks, we don't need wireless. All we need to do is plug ethernet cables back into our router and then just buy the adapters to hook up to your devices and then turn off the antennas. So, we don't know that we've been making these poor choices, but once we know better, we can do better. So all those apps that we got talked into, they are continuously updating in the background and using energy. So um, for me, as I'm learning more and more, I kept thinking, you know what? If this is as bad as little me can find out, surely somebody's gotta have our backs on this, right? And so I fell down the rabbit hole in 2013. In 2014, I helped our schools become the first in the nation to even have precautionary measures. And then the missing piece of the puzzle for me showed up in 2015 when Harvard Law School Center for Ethics came out with this online free report called Captured Agency, how the Federal Communications Commission is dominated by the industries it presumably regulates. And note the graphic they use on the cover of their 59 page report. It's a revolving door. And that's what most of our federal agencies have become today. The industry has gotten in there and put their own people at the helm. And that sadly is what has happened with the FCC, the FDA, the EPA, you know, CDC, 
We see it time and again, where we no longer have experts protecting the public. We have industry protecting profit. So that came out in 2015. More recently, a year ago, ProPublica put out a really good expose on how the FCC shields the cell phone companies from safety concerns. And we talked earlier about that $30 million study that was commissioned by our own Food and Drug Administration that concluded clear evidence of cancerous tumors and DNA damage from this wireless radiation. That should have triggered public policy but instead, there's somebody new at the helm, not the people who commissioned, excuse me, 20 years ago. Today, it's Dr. Jeffrey Shuren. And when we investigate his background, and again, we don't have to look very far, just go look him up. And you find that Dr. Shuren is married to an attorney who's a partner in a law firm that represents these companies. So he should have never been anywhere near that study. And sadly, these conflicts of interest go all the way up to the World Health Organization, to the United Nations. And as far back as 2011, the World Health Organization looked at the science on this. And there's five levels of categories they can assign. It wasn't that there was nothing showing harm. This went up into the third level that said, this looks to be a possible human carcinogen. What was missing at that time were the animal studies. And now that we've got those animal studies done, there is an investigation reopened at the World Health Organization. Um, but you may be hard pressed to find it. If you just search World Health Organization, radio frequency or EMFs, electromagnetic fields, you may very well be presented with really old data that makes you think, oh, well, jury's still out. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. How would you know how to find this, their current investigation? So there is corruption at every turn. How would we know that there are two groups at the World Health Organization addressing this? One group was the actual qualified scientists whose life's work is radio frequency radiation. The other group is very much protecting industry interests. We think that with this new investigation that the industry has probably gotten in there. So again, folks, there is no cavalry coming. They will drag this out as long as they can so they can continue to pollute our environments and reap their rewards. So um, that's all the bad news. Let's start talking about solutions so that we know what we can do. And again, this is not rocket science to fix. Some people are do-it-yourselfers. Some people are intimidated very much by wires and stuff, and that's okay. You can just hire an electrician to come in and help you do this. So on the back of your router, you'll see there are ethernet ports. Just get a big, long ethernet cable and run it to wherever you use your technology. And today, most people have more than one device in the house. So you can buy these things called ethernet switches. You can just think of them as extension boxes for uh, electronics, but this is how little they are. This is the little five quart one that I have in my living room, but in a classroom, you could get one with 28 or 30 ports on it. So again, there's solutions for everything. So you just run the main ethernet cable from the router, and then you get little ethernet cables and plug them in. And each one gets its own direct line to the internet. So you're not even competing like you were for wireless bandwidth in your own house. Wireless beats or I'm sorry, hardwired technology beats wireless hands down on everything except convenience. It is safer, it is faster, far faster to run your connections through wires. It's far more reliable. Your data and your privacy are so much better accounted for because you're not buckshotting your information out into the air where somebody at the curb with a $100 app can just start hacking into what you're doing. Um, so, you know, you can buy these little adapters. This one here, for those who have the iPhone, it's called the Lightning to RJ4 Ethernet adapter. And then uh, that goes right to the phone. And then if you have a Chromebook or a MacBook, or you can buy these little adapters like for the iProducts, it's the Thunderbolt. 
Um, but again, just go search for your make and model of your device and say, I want an Ethernet adapter, and you'll be able to find some um, products there. And the other groups that we mentioned, like uh, Tech Wellness, they have some there that you could go order from as well. And I'm not getting a kickback from anybody. I'm just trying to be helpful. So the first step is to hardwire, plug it all in. The second step is it doesn't automatically disable the antennas. You need to go into your settings. So for example, on the iPhone, if I go into settings, uh, I will see I have an option for airplane mode. So I would turn that on. But now I need to remember to also look and say, well, what does it say for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth? And is my hotspot off? So if Wi-Fi says not connected, or if Bluetooth says not connected, we got to remember this is a two-way signal between the tower or the router and your device. So if it just says not connected, that means that the device is still over there going, hello, 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 here I am. That means it's radiating to try and make that handshake. All you have to do is hit that button and turn it off. So again, try to get to as low as reasonably achievable. And that starts with only using what you need for as little amount of time as you can get away with. So turn off all the antennas you're not using and only turn it on when you need it. So that's step two, turn off those antennas. Step three is to measure. And I learned this the hard way. So my daughter, when she was in college, when she was home on summer break, she would teach swim lessons out of our pool. And she knows that I've hardwired the house. And she said, hey, mom, I just need to print my swim schedule. Can I just turn on the Wi-Fi real quick and, and print it out from my bedroom? And I said, yeah, sure. Just be sure and turn off the Wi-Fi when you're done with it. So she thought she had, and I thought she had. And come Monday morning, I'm sitting in my office and I feel like the earth is sucking me down again. And I'm like, why do I feel off? I've never felt good under fluorescent lights. So my body's given me biofeedback for decades, but I try to use incandescent light bulbs in my home. Um, I ate a clean organic breakfast that morning, but I just felt so off. So I pulled out my meter and it went right into the red zone and I went, huh? And I scanned it around my home office here and it was the printer. And the front plate has a little logo for Wi-Fi. And if Wi-Fi is on, it's going to be glowing, but it wasn't glowing. And I'm like, well, what's going on with my printer? So I went online and I pulled up the manual. And lo and behold, there were three antennas in that one device, just like our phones have multiple antennas. Um, and so all I had to do was learn from the manual how to go into settings and find each one of those antennas and turn it off. And then I measured and made sure that I literally had radio silence. So it's critical to measure because the industry is forecasting that we will all have 200 devices in our homes sending all this wireless signal. Their hope is that they will capture your data, they can repackage it, they can sell it off to people who will examine your usage patterns and then try to sell you information. Others think there are more nefarious things going on um, for tracking and privacy and data issues. So uh, it's wireless. Mm, wireless is not all of it. It's cracked up to be. So it's really important to measure because most things will have multiple antennas and you just don't know what you're up against until you can measure it. So some people will have the funds. They'll go right out and buy themselves a meter. This one is in the $400 range that was um, recommended at the EMF Medical Conference. It's the Safe and Sound Pro 2. And there are other meters in the $200 range that a lot of people like too. So you can go out to Safe Living Technologies and take a look and see what they recommend. Okay, so we've talked about what to do with the stuff that is under our control. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes going through some other areas that we are involuntarily being exposed to and talk about things that people are doing to help move the needle. So first, let's see what these other exposures are. When I was a little girl, and I mentioned a little bit ago that I'm the youngest of 10 kids, 
So we were outside a lot and we played a lot of hide and seek. So I'd be tucked away behind the bushes waiting for somebody to find me. And with 10 kids, it could take a while. But I keep myself busy just watching the little dials go around on the utility meters, you know, gas, water, electric. Today we have solar, maybe propane. Um, but those little dials, those were called analog meters. It was strictly just a mechanical meter that measured how much of that utility you were using. And then somebody would walk through the neighborhood and write down your reading, and then you would get your bill. That was safe metering. Then the industry came along to our towns and said, hey, we could save you some money and you won't have to pay the walkers to go through the town. We can do this digitally. So they started putting digital meters on our homes. And then in some communities, they've gone one step beyond the digital meters to actually smart grids. So here in my town, we're in the middle of that conversion. And for one of our meters, I think it's probably the gas meter, they do drive-bys. And they do it for our electric meters too. They do these drive-bys where the Department of Public Works will have somebody in their truck with a scanner. They'll point the scanner at the house and it will take the reading. Um, I have measured the electric meters on my home. We have one for solar and one for electric. And when I measured, I got a reading of 17,000 times in a 24-hour period. I've seen higher in other communities. And if you have somebody on the other side of the wall, all that radiation is coming into your house as well as throwing it out to the guy in the truck. So this is really bad. The industry will spin it up. And, you know, the guys at the help desk or the tech support, they don't know about this by and large. They've only been told from their companies that, oh, it's just a few seconds. It's not a big deal. But when that's coming at you 24 seven, it's a big deal. And so, we, if anybody wants to look at their meters, if you see a federal communications identif identification number, FCC ID, that tells you that has a radiating transmitter in it. And as Donna was telling us in her introductory remarks, she got very ill when a smart meter went on her home. And then when all the neighbors got them too, the aggregate radiation going from home to home really did her in. So, they pulse this radiation continuously. And remember how we talked about these microwaves amplify on metal? We have seen too many cases where the radiation can hop on the pipes or the wiring of the home and turn your home into one giant radiating antenna. If things are not improper, uh, properly grounded, we see far too many fires and explosions with a power surge. These smart meters are not engineered properly to protect your home. And we need to be very careful with this because when you have an electrical fire, what we've learned is that the fire department can't just show up and hose it down. If they were to do that, as soon as they put that water on an electrical fire, it could bounce back and electrocute them. So there's a whole process of contacting the utility company and then the utility company has to kill it from them and their end, communicate back to the fire department. This could take up to an hour. And on a windy day, that could send your whole neighborhood up in flames. So these are not smart meters. If you see anything labeled smart these days, that should be a red flag to start saying, what are they covering up? Data harvesting, privacy. And uh, at the EMF medical conference, they said when these smart meters go in, or when cell towers come in at close range or 5G small cells, they see a great uptick in people showing up with symptoms of microwave sickness. So this is sadly a very big environmental justice issue where these toxic industries roll into town. They roll out their toxic products where people are working three jobs in you know, underprivileged communities, economically depressed. They're just trying to keep a roof over their head and food on the table. And they are oftentimes not tuned in, tuned into what's going on in their community. So they'll do these pilot programs in these environmental justice communities and then say, hey, look at what a great success it was here. We're gonna roll it out all across your state. And hey, Massachusetts, look how great this one was in Worcester. And now New York, Rhode Island, Connecticut, you are falling behind, jump on the bandwagon. This is what you wanna be doing. And that's how they operate. 
And as I mentioned, they'll put one meter on your home and on every other home in the community. Your data gets picked up here with radiation signaling. All that radiation goes to the next house and compounds and compounds and compounds and compounds. And then it gets sent up to a collector, like a WiMAX thing hanging off of a pole. And then it theoretically gets sent off to the utility company to do your billing and to uh, perhaps be notified if there's a power outage or something. But there are also things they can be doing with your data that a lot of people really don't want them to have. So big, big issues. A couple of really great TED Talks, though. And we know that the TED Talks are all about 15 minutes. Jeremy Johnson is a Silicon Valley engineer, and his wife is a medical doctor, and they both got really sick very suddenly. Turns out there was a bank of smart meters that went in on their condo. And so Jeremy does a really good TED Talk. This is a nice one to show to engineers who have been, only been taught that, of course, Wi-Fi is fine. You have to have enough energy to cause heat before there can be any harm. Well, that whole thermal effect has gone right out the window with all the science. We don't need heat to have harm. We have FCC radiation levels allowed way up here at the heat level, but the science is showing us the harm is happening at hundreds of thousands of times below what our government and industry are allowing. Dr. Alexia McKnight is actually a radiologist. She's a veterinarian radiologist, so she works with this technology all the time, and she knows we need to protect ourselves from what's called ionizing radiation. That's the kind that can break the atom. What we're dealing with with this other man-made energy is non-ionizing, non-thermal, low-level man-made microwave radiation. So Dr. McKnight didn't understand that at the non-thermal level, there's great harm until a smart meter went on her home. And she gives a really good talk about what happened to her to the point where she was out in traffic and her brain could no longer piece together whether that green light meant stop or go. 50-50 proposition. Thank goodness she made the right choice and got home safely. But that's how damaging this is to our neurological functioning and our immune system and everything else. So our own devices, the utility smart meters, and then the cell towers, they started out in industrial parks, 300 feet up in the air, far away from where we had schools or homes or medical facilities or recreation fields. And then they started coming in lower and closer. So it is critical to help our towns look at the non-industry funded science. The industry of course says it's all fine because it's not causing any heat problems, but we know that no longer holds any weight. So when we look at the non-industry funded science, they have done epidemiological studies, and that was a new word I had to learn. That means they're studying what's actually happening out in society. So they found that where you have a cell tower, there is a death and neurotoxicity curve where people are getting anxiety, depression, insomnia, headaches, notes, speaks, all this stuff. That curve starts to come down at 500 meters, which for us would be 1,640 feet. It starts to come down at 500 meters, but it doesn't actually catch up to general population statistics to almost double that. So asking for a 500 meter setback or distance from a cell tower is already a compromise. We should have at least double that and where we've got vulnerable subpopulations of pregnant women and fetuses, children, the elderly, and anybody with an existing health compromise, this is a huge burden on top of that, that our bodies get to a point that we just can't keep up. So it's critically important to look at the non-industry funded science. And here in the US, you can go to a website called antennasearch.com and you can punch in any address um, when I do my home here in Ashland, Massachusetts, I find that there are, I don't know, maybe a hundred plus uh, cell antennas within a three mile radius. That's what this returns you on is a three mile radius. When I, put, when I put in the address down in downtown Boston, which is very much like every other large city that the industry's gotten into, when I put our state house address in, 
I was given 1,520 cell towers with 4,512 of these giant antennas, these macro cell antennas within three miles of our state house. Our cities are so electro polluted today. So we need to just start learning and working with industry to do much better. So that was the big cell antennas. Now the industry is pushing in 5G small cells for their internet of things, right? So 5G just means fifth generation technology. Because we had 1G where we just had a cell phone that made a phone call. Then we had 2G that added texting about 10 years later. Then another 10 years later, we got 3G, which got us a little bit of the internet. Then another decade later, we got like 4G, which gave us basically a computer right on our wrist, right in our hand. You know, whatever people are using, don't use those virtual goggles. Um, so now we're up to fifth generation technology. Some people get confused between 5G and 5 gigahertz, two different things. Fifth generation is a marketing term. It's not defined with standards or anything. Every company's doing it differently. That's just a marketing term, fifth generation or 5G. Five gigahertz means that five billion times per second you're getting pulsed with microwave radiation. So uh, last month, our guest co-host was Dr. Deborah Green, Deborah Green from Hawaii. And she has a really good little short, I think it's like a six minute video on what 5G is and what it isn't. Feel free to take a look at that. But the way the industry is marketing this is they're gonna say, here comes the future, innovation. We're gonna have smart cities, super highways, and you're gonna be able to download your stuff in like two seconds. Well, is that worth trading your health for? And now when we look around to see who's buying up the, the entertainment industry that's promoting all of this, it's the same companies that are selling you the products. So it's a new revenue stream. Um, and 5G doesn't march into its own little signal over there. 5G has to have the existing electro smog that we've got with 3G and 4G because they have longer wavelengths to carry data and signal. All that's left to monetize are these tiny little millimeter waves that get disrupted by things in their path like rain or snow or trees or buildings. So the industry solution is to add all these millimeter waves because with 5G, you need them. And because they only go a little distance, you're going to need to have millions of these everywhere, literally at the curb outside your home at bedroom height in order to connect with your 5G devices. So here we go. They're putting them up every two to 12 houses unless your town has updated their bylaws and forbids them in residential areas. And the way the law stands today, and we know they're up there trying to change the law to their benefit, but the way the law stands today is you don't have to do this in your town. They are pushing all this out and telling us that, oh, the public wants all this stuff, so we have to have more capacity. So they want to put all this new toxic, toxic infrastructure in to strengthen their capacity to sell more devices. And we don't need it. All we have to do is bring fiber optics to and through the premises and hook up indoors with wires. So it's a capacity demand thing that they're trying to push into our towns. And in the current law, the only thing your town has to ensure is that a cell phone call can be made. Not data, not streaming, none of this new 5G stuff, just a simple cell phone. So if you can make a phone call then within reason, you're all set. That's why you need to get your zoning by bylaws up to date. So we have far too many reports of the industry coming in, sometimes even under the cover of darkness and just lopping off the trees. Your bylaw should also say there has to be an arborist on staff or a consultant to make sure that we're not damaging the tree canopy 
at a time when our towns are replanting trees to try and cool our climate change cities. So it's bad on so many levels. And the kicker here is Congressman uh, Richard Blumenthal up in Washington, D.C. from Connecticut, who used to be the uh, attorney general there. He took the industry to task at a commerce hearing and said, so please tell us how much money have you invested in independent science to prove that 5G is safe? And these two industry guys just kind of hemmed and hawed and then ultimately were made to say, uh, we don't know of any funding that's been put forward to make sure. And so Senator Blumenthal said, so basically, as far as health and safety are concerned, we're flying blind here. And that's the way they operate. They push it in, ask questions later. Um, but this is a great four minute clip from our friends at Environmental Health Trust. And then even Computer World and other industry magazines are reporting out that 5G is a bad joke. It's not even giving us the faster speeds over 4G that we already had. So, and there went Verizon, you know, boasting in 2022, we are serving 5G to 100 million customers. Well, um, this next link here, some people get pushed back on because there was a lot of rumor flying around that the pandemic was caused by 5G. Well, that's not what the science says. What the science says is when we have a pandemic, we are supposed to look at three things, the virus, the host or the people and understand what their individual makeup is like and whether they have specific vulnerabilities like age or health compromises. And then we're supposed to look at the environment to reduce the load of toxicity in the environment. Well, we kind of did one and two, but we never got to three. We never addressed the other factors that can weaken the immune system that could leave us vulnerable to COVID-19. So Dr. Rob Brown and Dr. Beverly Rubick uh, did this study and they found statistically significant numbers that show where 5G and other high levels of environmental radiation exist, they had statistically significant higher COVID rate cases and higher deaths. And once you understand the science, it makes common sense. We can't keep adding these burdens onto our body with this radiation on top of what your body may already be dealing with. And then when a virus comes along, nobody in the scientific community is surprised that we get really sick. So um, usually when a, pub, a paper is submitted for publication, it goes through peer review. And that's usually two or three other experts in the field who review the study to make sure it was done up to scientific integrity. And so they knew this was gonna be a hard one because of all the censorship that's been going on in the media around COVID. Um, and they actually had 15 or 16 peer reviews on this highly credible paper. So use it if you will. For some people, my own state representative uh, said to me, Cece, you lost me when you started talking about COVID. And I said, Jack, Jack Lewis is my state rep. I said, Jack, I'm not saying the pandemic was caused by COVID, but please read this study and you will see that we can't keep exposing ourselves to all these environmental pollutants and stay healthy. Okay, so our own devices, the smart meters, the cell towers, and the small cells. The satellites are also another consideration, but we won't go there today. So Dr. Magda Havis, who was the co-chair of the EMF Medical Conference, She's retired out of Trent University in Canada, where she taught EMFs for 25 years. So she is one of the leading scientists. She knows this inside and out. And she also knows that our countries, by and large, are dropping the ball on measuring all of this cumulative radiation exposure out there. So she started her global EMF monitoring project, and she nicknamed it her Brad Project. Can you brag about the radiation in your town? Or B is for black, blackout where it's really bad, over 100,000 microwatts per square meter. Remember, indoors, we want to be, you know, no higher than 10 around our sleeping areas and preferably no higher than 100 indoors. 
outside, if you're at 100,000, that's bad. In the scientific literature years ago, they said if we could be at a thousand or less outdoors and you had a clean environment to do cell repair at night, we could probably get by with that. Um, so B is for black, R is for red, 10,000 to 100,000, A is for amber, 1,000 to 10,000, and G is for green, less than uh, less than 1,000 outdoors. So if you go, if you go to globalemf.net, you'll be able to see her map and drill down and play around and see if anybody's done any readings and at what point in time was that done uh, to see can you brag about your community. And then Dr. Havis is asking us to be citizen scientists and you have to have the same instruments. So for anybody who purchases the Safe and Sound Pro 2 meter, you can volunteer to be a citizen scientist and she'll give you a protocol. There's something you can put on a clipboard and go out and take measurements. You know, you'll be standing on all four corners at five intersections of your town and waving this around. Um, so if you want to be a citizen scientist, it's not hard. Take a friend out so one can be measuring and one can be writing it down. And then you can help contribute to the science. So anybody who wants to do that and has not yet purchased the Safe and Sound Pro Meter, reach out to them at globalemf.net and let them know you would like to purchase the meter and you would also like to participate in their study and they have a discount code that they can give you i think when i bought mine it was like 20 or 25 percent off and on a 400 dollar meter that's a significant savings so if you want to play please go out and measure for your community so what do some of these outdoor measurements really look like today the goal again less than a thousand would put us in the green in New Hampshire, at the Westmoreland Fire Department, it was in the green at 417. Keene, New Hampshire, a couple of years ago was in the yellow, uh, but I understand that these 5G small cells have come in at the curb and they are probably now much higher into the red or the black. Nashua, New Hampshire, Concord, right there where their capital is. Uh, Deb Hodgson, who's the impetus behind the great work that's been done in New Hampshire, uh, she and I took some readings at the state house walking around during the pandemic. So there really was no foot traffic to speak of, very few yeah. cars driving by. Um, and so they were already in the red zone in Stratum, New Hampshire, where Deb lives. We went down the main drag and they had put a cell tower right up there. And so they were in the blackout zone. So this is what's happening in our communities. And then I went down with a resident in the north end of Boston. And then anybody who's toured Boston may remember that we've got this amazing north end where these incredible Italian bakeries and restaurants are. But this is where a lot of immigrants moved, you know, early last century and live. They moved in. People live right on top of all these storefronts. And these pretty wrought iron lampposts are actually 5G small cells right at the curb. So on Hanover Street, which is the main drag, they put in these pretty lights, cell towers. But when you look down the cross streets, they put these ugly gray monopoles up right outside people's bedrooms. So, you know, we really need to teach our towns what we can do to protect ourselves from the radiation and to keep the aesthetics. So... That's all the bad news. Now, Martin Luther King Jr. taught us when we make important changes in society and finally start getting it right, it comes through three channels. One, the public learns about it and starts doing something about it. And that's what we hope to inspire today. Second, it goes through the courts. And in this case, the industry and our federal agencies would be held accountable. And in the third area, public policy eventually catches up. That's like sometimes the last thing that comes into play. So cool thing, I'm in airplane mode, but my timer still works. I wanted to be sure that we leave a few minutes at the end for questions and answers. So the three areas here on public engagement, what's happening in the courts and public policy, I'll skim over them for you. And that way you'll know you have some places to come back and dive deeper if you're interested in those areas. And then we'll start looking at solutions again. So legal solutions. Remember when we said that Dr. Jeffrey Shuren, whose wife works for the industry, is in charge of the radiation at the Food and Drug Administration. 
when that National Toxicology Program $30 million study determined clear evidence, the highest category they can assign of cancerous tumors and DNA damage and other harm, that should have triggered Jeffrey Shuren to get public policy in place to protect you and I and our planet. Instead, Dr. Shuren went over to his friends at the FCC and said, ah, well, gee, we don't really believe those studies, so let's just keep doing what we're doing. And as I mentioned, that didn't do us any good. So what the FCC did with that is they put a formal statement in something called the Federal Register. Meanwhile, they had had a, a docket or a file open for six years and all the science poured in, all the medical, all the sick people, all the testimonies went into the public record and the FCC completely ignored the public record and said, we see no, we see no reason to change our, our radiation exposure limits. Once that hit the federal register as an official declaration that the FCC wasn't going to change anything, then the lawsuits could begin. So the Environmental Health Trust sued, Children's Health Defense sued, and other parties across the country sued, and it all got combined into one big lawsuit uh, that was called the Environmental Health Trust versus, at all, versus the Federal Communications Commission. And they worked hard for months and months and pulled together everything out of that public record thousands and thousands of dollars it took to do this. And they presented each of the judges with 27 big fat binders, 11,000 pages of evidence of harm, gave it to the judges. And the judges are looking at all of this and saying to the FCC attorney, so where's your homework? How did you determine that you're gonna stick with those 1996 heat-based limits for public radiation? And the FCC attorneys did one of these and said, well, the FDA said it was fine. And so the judges, of course, say, well, where's the FDA's homework? And there is none. Not one of our federal agencies has done the independent review of the science on this. So we have a huge regulatory gap. And the judges ruled against the FCC and sent it back to them. And they remanded it back. They said they were arbitrary and capricious. I had to go look that up, too. It basically means they made it up and they didn't do their homework. So that's where it stands right now with the FCC, but that has been two and a half years now, and the FCC has done nothing to protect you and I. So there is no cavalry coming, but there are important inroads happening, and all three areas have to get this right. So there's a ton of lawsuits going on in the courts. Um, I want to make a shout out to Children's Health Defense, which is representing citizens in the town of Pittsfield, Massachusetts, out here in the Berkshires. It's a very bucolic, beautiful area where like uh, Herman Melville from Moby Dick fame, um, just a beautiful area that people choose to buy into because they choose a certain lifestyle. Well, didn't Verizon come in and put up a cell tower right up on top of a neighborhood just as we were shutting down for the pandemic. So all the parents are home 24 seven, all the children are home 24 seven, all the pets are home 24 seven. And these families had seen these trucks driving into their neighborhood and breaking through into the woods at the end of the street. And they're like, hey, what's going on? They called their town. Town hall didn't know. They called their department of public works. They didn't know. They called their legislators. They didn't know. They called the police. They didn't know. But the police came down and put up some tape to just put a pause on things until they could figure out what was going on. Well, these guys in their trucks from the industry blew right through that tape. They told the neighbors they were the cost of doing business, that this is all in the name of progress. So one day this little girl comes downstairs and goes, Mom, my head really hurts. I feel all buzzy inside. Mom picks up the phone and calls Verizon, and lo and behold, that was the day that cell tower got turned on with six of those big macro antennas, and it's licensed for 48. That little girl got sick. Her older sister got sick. The mom got sick. The dog got sick. Neighbors, headaches, nosebleeds, nausea, dizziness, anxiety, ringing in the ears, cancers that had been in remission had come back, and some had 
sadly die. They've been fighting this for three years and they have had to abandon their homes. People are couch surfing, people are sleeping in their cars, they're sleeping in the woods in tents, which here in New England, you can only do so many months out of the year. So they kept going back to their local boards, their, their city council. They tried getting their mayor to help them. Ultimately, the city council ordered their board of health to investigate. So the Pittsfield Board of Health spent 18 months speaking to the world leading scientists, speaking to the doctors who have diagnosed these families with electromagnetic illnesses, speaking to the engineers who are qualified to tell us exactly what this radiation is doing. And they also spoke to the industry expert. So the Pittsfield Board of Health, where they had already fought environmental toxins with General Electric years ago, they recognized the Big Tobacco Playbook when they see it, and they wrote an emergency order calling Verizon to the table within the next seven days, and let's figure this out, or they're going to issue a cease and desist order. Verizon is not known to play nice in the sandbox, and at the 11th hour, they didn't come to the table. They went to the courts and got an injunction against the Board of Health. And so the Board of Health, meanwhile, had talked to the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards that has a team of attorneys. And they believe they have discovered that yes, the Telecom Act does have certain prohibitions in it, but that's only for the siting of the cell tower. They believe that Congress's intent was that once it's operational, the jurisdiction falls to the Board of Health to ensure the health and safety of the people and the environment. So the Board of Health went to their town and said, look, there's a couple pathways we could go. It may come up to 80 some odd thousand um, and their mayor and their city council would not back their own Board of Health and give them the money. They were bullied into rescinding that order to Verizon. So now there is a citizen lawsuit with great thanks to Children's Health Defense for defending them. And it's now in the courts. And we hope to know by this spring whether the courts will uphold their Board of Health, remove that injunction, and let the Board of Health do its job and issue that cease and desist order legally. So that is groundbreaking. That's the first time in our country a Board of Health has come to defend the citizens. And that could be what turns this issue. But we can't wait. We have to get our citizens educated and protected now because the courts take years for any of this. We had a big lawsuit here in Massachusetts where the courts recognized there are biological effects at the non-thermal level, and there are many lawsuits happening all over the country. But again, we don't hear about it in mainstream media because it's owned by the industry. Policy solutions. So bottom line, we've had bills in Massachusetts for 10 years. Deb Hodgson brought her, st her state representative down to my home in Massachusetts from New Hampshire. We sat at my kitchen table. We helped him connect the dots. They came out with a groundbreaking bill that got passed into law to form a commission in seven months' time, and then they had a year to investigate. Why have Lloyds of London, Swiss RE, AM Best, and others long since recognized this as a world-leading risk, and they don't cover for damages? So that can leave our towns holding the bag when people are damaged, if a cell tower falls or if there's a fire or if people are getting sick. So, and why do we even have that legal fine print? Why is the FCC dropping the ball on thousands of studies? Why are they not looking at the biological effects? Why does the US allow a hundred times more radiation than certain other countries? Well, because we have the industry here. Why is nobody accounting for the cumulative effect of all of our devices going and jackhammering us all the time? So bottom line, in seven months, we got this groundbreaking report. It's in my signature on my emails. This is probably the best document in our country because they had highly qualified scientists, doctors, uh, public health people, state agencies, and the industry at the table. And what I love, especially about that Pittsfield report, is 
Verizon brings in this Dr. Eric Swanson, who they claim is an expert. Meanwhile, he has never published one single paper on the biological effects of radio frequency radiation. He is a physicist but he publishes on quarks and other unrelated areas of physics. He is no expert and they document that in their emergency order. Same thing when we were testifying up here, they brought Dr. Swanson up, they brought this other guy from California and these guys just come in and tell disinformation statement after disinformation. Um, and Understanding. Documents. Mm -hmm. Please mute. S, F. Please mute. So excellent review by Dr. Kent Chamberlain, who served on this commission. He retired now from the University of New Hampshire, where he headed up as chair and professor of their Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He thought this would be a slam dunk. Of course, it's fine. Well, he's done a complete 180, and he'll tell you why. So there have been bill after bill to try and do the 15 recommendations in that report to migrate away from wireless for primary connectivity and transition to hardwired fiber optics or high-speed cable to and through the premises. And then once we all hardwire and turn off the antennas, we no longer have the capacity demands that are driving all this infrastructure at close range. So we're grateful that Microsoft Canada's Frank Clegg testified. And the bottom line is wireless tech is no longer advanced tech. It's outlived its useful life as a main source of connectivity. It should be used sparingly on the go, not while we're sitting still. So we have introduced several bills to enact everything in the um, New Hampshire Commission report. And every time the industry gets in there and torpedoes it. Maine had a really good bill this last session. Connecticut did too. Again, torpedoed, torpedoed by industry. We have our bills today that need to be reported out of committee, literally today. One has already come out that would form a commission like New Hampshire did. But come on, New Hampshire's already done it. Let's just get the work done and start protecting our communities. But we're grateful for every advancement that we do get. But we can't wait for public policy to catch up. That's the last step. We need to be in our communities educating and protecting. So here's all the bills that we had. Um, nobody's tracking this sickness. So we already have a database in Massachusetts that tracks illnesses. We want electromagnetic sensitivity, which is the term used by the Americans with Disabilities Act. We want EMS recognized and tracked and reported on so we can make better informed public health decisions. So lots of good bills here and there are many happening in many other states. So feel free to go poke around. The industry rolls into town and says, oh yeah, here, we're gonna give you faster signal. Everyone's gonna be happier. And we're gonna give you some money for letting us put these antennas up on the public access way, our public access way, by the way. And uh, ignore those people, ignore the NIMBYs, the not in my backyards. They just don't want it, you know. Well, they tell our towns, nobody else is talking about this and nobody else cares. Well, you can go to Americans for Responsible Technology and see more than 150 groups all across the country who are working on this. And the good news is they have all sorts of um, tools in their toolkit to start a group if there's not one already listed nearby and go learn, go get the local lessons learned on what the systems are through which you need to navigate and empower your own town to do the right thing. So town after town gets involved and we start seeing some good inroads. Sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back, but we keep at it and we see great successes. So cities across the country have banded together and filed with the FCC. They didn't win, but they started showing solidarity and that's a huge step in the right direction. So lots of good things that we can jump off of to use in our own communities. Stamford, Connecticut just recently brought in experts to educate their municipality. Meanwhile, the industry got in the governor's ear and came up with some deal that the governor turned around and wanted to roll out in his five largest cities to put 5G small cells at the curb inside neighborhoods, right outside people's homes. Once they got educated, these really smart, public leaders said, uh, no, thank you, governor. 
we're fine. We don't want that 5G package that you and the industry have put together. So it can be done, but education has to come first. Those recordings of all of that are available and you're more than welcome to access that. In Easton, Connecticut, a grandmother figured out what was going on, went to her board of health. They put a moratorium on and they have since re-upped that moratorium. Hawaii County, um, they too put a resolution for it. It doesn't have legal teeth, but at least it's showing solidarity that with some education and some citizens getting active, we can address this and it's happening all over the world. So our poor kids in schools are sitting there in toxic soup. We just had a new elementary school open last fall and there was an open house on the weekend. So the kids weren't in the building with all their devices going, but the industry had convinced the engineer who was in charge of this, that every classroom should have a wireless access point on the ceiling, every hallway. In reality, one or two could probably service the whole building, but more money for the industry if they can put one up everywhere, right? So I went in there on the tour and I stayed behind the tour group. And as they moved on, I stuck around and I took my meter and my phone, which I can record off of, it's in airplane mode, so it's not radiating me. And I took these little mini clips that are on my YouTube panel or page. Outside, when I got out of my car, it was in the green because we don't have cell towers near that school. As soon as I got into the building and I started walking through the gymnasium, the art room, the music room, the tech room, the library, the classrooms, the hallways, the principal's office, red, 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 off the charts. We want to be at 10 microwatts per square meter or less. I was getting readings up into the hundreds of thousands. So that's what our schools have become. Thankfully, we have um, doctors in Louisiana who got a unanimous bill passed to start trying to find some balance. They couldn't take the EMF issue head on, but they at least got some balance back in so the kids are not in front of screens all the time. They're making sure they have meaningful interaction with their peers with their teachers, with nature, and that they're outside moving. So that was a good law that just came about. And look at this, the Netherlands, Finland, other countries are taking tech out of the classroom because we got sold a bill of goods. Children do not learn best from technology. It's a huge distraction and it's harming the educational process. Here, the New York Times did a series of articles that show Silicon Valley execs are banning screens from their children's schools. They're making their nannies sign contracts that there will be no screens around their kids. They know, and yet they push it out onto ours. Our friends at Grassroots Environmental Education, they have the Americans for Responsible Technology Project that has the whole toolkit for everybody. They also have built this Tech Safe Schools program where if you reach out to them, they will send a packet of information to get you started. They'll send it to your school leaders and then you follow up and continue to get everybody around you educated on that and then start talking to the schools. Dr. McKnight and I did a professional development seminar at her children's schools for their PD or professional development day. That's a 46 minute resource right there for your schools. The Breast Cancer Coalition in Massachusetts has already built with the experts K through 12 curriculum for prevention it's all here, you guys. We just need you to be the boots on the ground and get this going. So huge resources already here. Same thing for the folks in the other professions. We have the EMF Medical Conference. And now the first textbook for medical school has been published by Dr. Panagopoulos in Greece with chapters provided from experts from all over the world. Dr. Cindy Russell, Dr. Joel Moskowitz founded Physicians for Safe Technology a very highly credible website for you to send your medical teams to. And then for engineers, physicists, technologists, architects who have only heard you have to have VTAB harm, we have incredible resources for you to share with them as well. And then for us in our own offices, in our own homes, if you're not a do-it-yourselfer, here's the link to the Building Biology Institute where you can hire a consultant. The award-winning film, Generation Zapped, 
is available through the streaming services at our libraries for many of our towns now, or you can just download it for a few bucks online. Uh, we just found out in the USA, it's been censored on Amazon Prime, but in Europe, I think it's still available on Amazon Prime. Uh, but this is a great way in 74 minutes to sit down with your friends and loved ones and the parents of the kids that your kids hang out with. Just sit down and start the conversation. Our little 15 seconds of fame with what we did in Ashland Public Schools is included in the film. And look at this, come and mainstream PBS. Shout out to Camilla Reese and Dr. Erica Mallory Blythe. They worked with Burt Wolf and did two half hour episodes. Those are great things to train with. And here's the toolkit to teach you how to become an advocate. And, you know, guys, we need to really examine what we're doing because we know our kids are big fans of monkey see, monkey do, and they're going to do whatever they see us doing. So we have to be the role models. And then I love this poster. Uh, I think I found it first through Huffington Post, but 50 ways to take a break to get off our devices, get out and help somebody. Go do something creative with music or writing or make a play. Go sleep in a hammock and connect with nature. Go walk in the woods. Go help the neighbor. You know, all these things that are so fun and fulfilling once we take that break from tech. And then there's the Earth Prescription. There was an earlier book called, I think it was called Earthing by Dr. Sinatra and uh, some others who pulled in all the science on how the earth gives us this natural healing energy. And I got it, but I live in the Northeast and I can't be walking around barefoot for half the year here. So I love this new book that Dr. Conover released poor thing, right before the pandemic. Um, but she takes it through every season. So the four seasons and gives dozens of ways to get outside and connect with nature naturally and ground. So that's a really good book too. So again, we want to get to as low as reasonably achievable. We have to investigate. This is my web page for municipal leaders. Lots of good things for them. And always remember, don't go by what the industry is telling. Go by what the uh, non-industry funded scientists and telecom experts are telling us. This book is free and online. It's called Reinventing Wires. You can print out the PDF. And it teaches our towns all these risks from health, from public safety, from privacy, security, speed, reliability, sustainability, you know, climate change, all free. It's a beautiful roadmap for our towns. And remember when we measure, don't go against those phony guidelines that the FCC put out, go by the biological effects. And um, if you buy a meter, you'll get all of that from Safe Living Technologies. So next steps, don't kid yourself, none of this is safe. You have to hardwire and turn off the antennas. And Dr. Linda Birnbaum, who was in charge of the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences when that NTP study was done, that was under her jurisdiction. She said there are definitely still some good people at the federal level, but there's also a lot of industry capture going on. And it's going to take us at the local and state level to push this up to empower meaningful change at the federal level. So we've got to be the change. We're doing these free webinars every month, so please come back and join us. I've been brought in to do um, webinars or in-person events at select board meetings, at health forums, you know, however we can get the education out there, please, and let's just get our schools trained. We can fix that today. There is no law stopping us. So start where you are. Do you belong to professional organizations? Are they looking for public speakers for their you know, quarterly meetings or their annual meetings? I would be honored to be brought in. I just came back in January from a, a convention down in Virginia with medical providers. So if I can help, please just let me know. I walked away from my tech writing career to do this work. So if there is budget, I do ask for a speaker's honorarium and travel expenses but I've actually never said no to anybody. So let's see what we can do together. So for ourselves and our towns, we need to start looking at townwide tech safety committees. Now that technology is here to stay, let's make sure we get it right. Do not allow those smart meters into our towns and especially make sure everybody has the right to opt out of them. Let's start getting our schools, our libraries, our town halls hardwired 
and get the radiation out or have just one little zone where people can go if they need to hop on their phones or something. And get your local bylaws strengthened. Americans for Responsible Technology has their toolkit. They have checklists, they have sample ordinances, and they have real ones. So you can look to see like what this town in New York did, what this town in California did. And don't be shy about encouraging your town to hire a telecom expert. Andrew Campanelli used to work for industry. He knows their playbook inside and out. He knows the telecom laws inside and out, and he will investigate your state laws as well as the federal. And I think his rate is about $8,500 to come in and look at your current zoning, rewrite it, and give you something that your town can now protect itself with under current law. Okay, so for today, folks, we know this is a lot. We know that this is like drinking water out of a fire hose, as they said at the medical conference. But what can you do? If you need to go scream into a pillow to get started, that's what I used to tell my kids when they were upset. Go scream into a pillow. Don't let it stay in your body. Get it out. And then notice what you have radiating around you. Start with baby steps. Maybe you'll put all your antennas in airplane mode until you actually need one and then only turn that one on for a short amount of time as you need it. Create a sleep sanctuary. Protect your sleep so your body stands a chance at repairing itself. Ethernet cables and adapters. Again, not rocket science. Just hook them up. Turn off the antennas and measure. So our friends at Environmental Health Trust has sheet after sheet after sheet, all these postcards and stuff all these resources that you can have in your office to easily hand somebody something to have credibility. And we have a card out at Massachusetts for safe technology too. So we thank you for sticking with us. We know it's a lot to get your head around, but guess what? You are halfway there right now because now you know. Now you just need to do your own gap analysis, fix what you can. And when you pluck up enough courage, start talking to your town. But my words of advice, or do not go it alone. I expected when we presented the facts that good public servants are going to jump in and protect us. But guess what? Most of them are not public leaders. They're here to serve the public. And if the public hasn't done its job to get enough people informed with enough voice, they've got a million other priorities they got to get to. So we have to do our job first. Do not go it alone. Get everybody around you educating using the Film Generations app, using the toolkits that are available, sending them our way, and we will educate for you. You don't have to know it all. Just know enough to get people to start listening with you. The second thing, so don't go it alone. The second thing is show them the fine print and get a meter. So once you do that, everybody's been conditioned to go, Tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist, as soon as you open your mouth and say there's something wrong with wireless, that's where their brain goes. But you show them the legal fine print in their iPhone, you measure the radiation and tell them it should be a 10 and you're at two or three million. Now you have their attention and then you can open the door to teach them the rest or send them my way and they'll teach them. So you can reach out to Dr. Donna Ott on their website, which is Pennsylvanians for Safe Technology, or you can email Donna directly here. Uh, here's the interview that she and I just did. It's a 28 minute episode. You can click there and watch that to learn more about her experiences in Pennsylvania. My website has a lot of really good resources. You know, we try to use a lot of white space so it doesn't look dark and scary. Um, or you can email me directly right here at Massachusetts for Safe Tech, ma4safetech at gmail.com. So thank you everybody. We know it is an awful lot. Um, we'll stop the sharing now and see, uh, Donna, if you're with us still, can you yeah. unmute and let us know if there's anything in the chat that we should address? Oh, there's lots that's been in the chat. Um, and Deborah Chandler has been so kind as to put in a lot of links that I didn't have access to. Thank um, you, Deb. I didn't want to navigate away and lose I got dropped once I don't know what happened my whole computer went white and I thought oh no but then it came back on I saw it. I'm like there she is <laughs> where'd I go <laughs> came back um 
are. So yeah, let's spend a couple of minutes and quickly go through anything we can address uh, in the chat that's still outstanding. Yeah, I didn't notice anything. I think we've answered all the questions, unless someone can think of one that's not. Oh, thank you, Deborah. You were, were very kind. Um, yeah, the thing that like really struck me that you described so well was sudden onset microwave sickness with smart meters. I thought, what a great way to describe it. Because that's exactly what happens. Like for a small number of people, it's very sudden and it's very severe and it's very irreversible. Yeah, there was um, a couple that moved to New York City and had a friend there who let them, you know, stay with them in their guest room until they got settled on their own. And all of a sudden they started getting all this anxiety and depression and they couldn't sleep. And there was a cell tower right on the roof. So, you know, close range, sudden onset or chronic exposure over time, you may hit that tipping point too. So, right. okay. Uh, Deb, go ahead and let us know what you want to say. Sure. Hi. Well, as you know, Cece, um, I am facing a no-fault eviction. I need to find a place to live. My long-term goal is to create the tiny house village for us little chickens. Um, but in the meantime, you had emailed me something the other day that I want to continue to follow up on, and that is um, the creation of a white zone. Like, mm -hmm. so if we go live in a new place, you know, in general, there's no guarantee that it's not then going to have a new cell tower or whatever um affecting us you said something in in massachusetts a lot of the towns uh are setting up diversity equity and inclusion teams and that somehow we can we can piggyback on that to create this kind of white zone yeah i think that would be a really nice thing for us all to think about doing so all of our towns here in massachusetts have been given uh, direction from the state level and perhaps funding to put somebody in place to head up a diversity, inclusion, and equity committee. And that goes to all sorts of equity and non-discrimination. And we know that we need to have safe housing. So I think this presents a really lovely opportunity for all of us to educate our towns mm -hmm. on what we need. We have to have housing for people who cannot live in a in an electro polluted environment? Yeah. We have a senior citizen here in Massachusetts um, who's just wonderful, and she's so heart centered and so smart. Well, she was getting fried in her senior subsidized housing. She was on the first floor, and underneath her was all the electronics for the building, all the wiring and stuff. And there's some really faulty wiring in there. And an electrician came in for the housing department and he said, oh, everything looks fine, but they don't know what to measure for. So she brought in Ken Gartner, who's um, an engineer and he's uh, this close to becoming a certified building biologist. And Kent has different equipment that he can measure with. And he said, oh yeah, you know, this is not hard to fix, but that is uninhabitable to be living right above those high electric and magnetic fields let alone the radio frequency that's coming in from her neighbors on the walls abutting her unit. So poor Leonore, she is actually sleeping outside. She is a senior citizen in her 70s who has pitched a tent outside and she's not complaining. She really likes being out in nature. But now we're in winter. Yeah. We need housing that is safe. Mm -hmm. You know, some housing is smoke-free. We need to have EMF safe, radiation-free zone. So these diverse, the DEI could perhaps create that opportunity. So everybody get a meter, get your science and get out there and start creating these opportunities because nobody fixes it for us. We yeah. have to lead. And real quick, Cece, so others have a chance. You mentioned someone charges 8,500 to go in and change the town zoning. Was that Scott McCullough? No, that was Andrew Campanelli. Andrew Campanelli. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I think it's actually Gail Dalby behind the Richard Dalby hand that is raised. Gail, is that you? Well, it's actually Richard. Oh, hi, Richard. Welcome. Hi. Um, I was just looking on antenna search. I put this in the chat just too. And I noticed there's non-registered towers and registered towers. And I'm wondering what the difference is. I think it has something to do with height, but if anybody else knows a better answer, I think over a certain height, they have to be registered, 
with the FCC, uh -huh. okay. which could be another sneaky way of how they get these things done. Um, does anybody else have any comment on that? Okay. Um, so if you can get in touch with the building biologists, they really know the numbers and stuff better on that, and they would be, they would be better able to specifically answer. Yeah, because my related question to that is, if you see that list on antennasearch.com, how do you look at it cumulatively? How much is going to be okay for, for some of us? Yeah. Ken also came to my house, so that's a question I could ask him. Yeah, ask Ken, but, you know, they say for vulnerable subpopulations, a half a mile minimum. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. No, I'd be really interested in working with you and others. I think that we may have better success in, in teams, maybe even interstate efforts. And there are other states working on the same thing. And because the stories that you're, you know, relaying are the same ones I'm seeing. Right. 70 year old sleeping in tents. Um, we've got another one who's been in the car for six years. I just found out about her. And now they're going to roll the rest of these smart meters out. And I think we really need to band together and really... It's hard. And here we've got so many people are sick. It's really hard to fight. Know, and that's just it. The, the advantage of it can't go to their state houses. They can't go into their <clears throat> town halls and speak to people because they're sick and the environment makes them sick wherever they go. So I know with Deb and the tiny home um, opportunities she's trying to create, they're going to have to be mobile tiny homes because, like you said, there was a woman who came up and testified with us in New Hampshire. And she spent $80,000 going to the Dallas clinic with Dr. Stephanie McArdle and um, Elizabeth Seymour, $80,000 to get her health back. And then she very mindfully chose a community up in New Hampshire where the EMF readings were very low so she could continue to heal and live what might one day be a normal life. And then don't you know, industry rolls into town and they would have, they they put in applications to put a cell tower on every corner, all four corners of that town. Yeah. So I'm talking with her, Christina, mm -hmm. and just again, try to tag on to that. I am thinking my newest brainstorm is to create a real estate investor group for us, what I call canaries, you know, those of us with the EMF sensitivity and the chemical sensitivities, yeah. and I have chronic Lyme, so that we can talk amongst ourselves about the real estate related solutions. Yeah, you know, and I love that, Deb. I've been watching as you connect with other groups around yeah. um, Northeast and perhaps elsewhere. Yeah. I agree with both of you that these collaborative efforts are really really what we need. And, you know, Donna, anytime that we can help support anything you're doing there, I know I've sent in testimony for other states. Um, I was just down in Virginia at that other medical conference, and we cleared the calendar for a day and went to the state house and started meeting with the senators. And Oh, you know, that's excellent. You no, know, we could actually, if you're ever in Pennsylvania or you know, traveling through that would be really helpful. I used to be able to go and, you know, lobby or advocate. I prefer advocate because we're nobody paying us. Um, yeah, because nobody's paying us to lobby. I think no. that's what a lobbyist is. They get paid to do it. Yeah, and I think too, like kind of keeping each other abreast of like what we're doing in terms of alternative housing, because here mm -hmm. we're really between a rock and a hard place because these final 108 are going to be ruled against. And I'm really very... Um, that we're going to have some very bad outcomes. Right. Oh, and uh, if we created a Northeast group, may I add you to that mail? Oh, yes, please. I would be very grateful. You can send it to uh, pasafetech at protonmail.com. That's the one that you put in the chat. Well. Okay. Is that the one that you put in the chat? It is. It's the same pasafetech, just protonmail.com. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, any other questions? Gail, go ahead. I, first of all, Cece, you are a gift from God that I get <laughs> every day yes. for your presence on this planet. So no, I just got a good 10-year head start on you. That's all. <laughs> you are so inspiring. I tell everybody oh, about it. Send them my way. <laughs> yes, we will. And Richard and I want to be part of a Connecticut group if you can send that information to us somehow. Excellent. I love these synergies. Um yeah, there are others in Connecticut. So are you connected with others in Connecticut? No, I, the only thing I do is listen to your broadcast. Okay. Gail, shoot me an email so that I remember. 
Okay. Um, and I will introduce you to others in Connecticut too. There's some really good people there and especially state rep David Michelle and rep Ann, I can't remember her name. Uh, David Michelle is out of Stamford, Connecticut, and he's the one who actually brought in the team of experts to educate his team. He had invited me in to do a lunch and learn remotely during the pandemic with his colleagues at the state house. So I was able to present there and he's done work with Dr. Deborah Davis and with uh, Blake Levitt. So he lined up a whole team of them to go in and educate and that's exactly what they did. So there's movement in Connecticut. Good, good, good. good. But I just saw the comment here from you about large metal boxes are being placed everywhere now. Wonder what they are all about. We often see that and I think it's important to really look into that and see what it is, and also to really start talking about the amount of energy that's needed to power all of this. Because if we're supposed to be green, how is that green? I mean, we never, you know, in the previous 50 years, none of us ever saw anything like that. Right. Now, all right. of a sudden. So, are... yeah, they call these things, well, when you see a cell tower, there's a whole cage thing with all this equipment on the ground too. That's all your backup and battery and all sorts of um, highly explosive stuff. <laughs> so when they start putting these small cells in at the curb, the industry will say, oh, it's just the size of a backpack or a pizza box, you know, no big deal. But it comes with a refrigerator size box or two somewhere on the ground that can be very dangerous. Um, so our zoning bylaw should be addressing that. None of those boxes should be able to block ADA access. Uh, there's so much we can put in our zoning bylaws, but it takes a citizen. I'm going to talk to my select board tonight. <laughs> I, I didn't get it done with our planning board. They blobbed it over to the select board. So still working on it. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right, everybody. Well, thank you again. Uh, we will send out the video and my slides. Do with them what you want. Share them as widely as you care to. Use them for your own knowledge. Drill around. See what you come up with. Um, but hey, have a tech safe day, guys, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much, Cece. You betcha. And De Donna, thank you so much for giving us your time. Um, and we'll do this again on the 22nd at 6 p.m. Eastern. All right, everybody, take Thank care. Bye-bye. So okay. Bye. Should we save the chat? Yeah. It. Yeah, anybody who wants to save the chat before we click uh, end, down at the bottom of the chat, there's a little dot, 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 the little ellipse. If you click on that, it gives you the opportunity to save it to your own computer. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You betcha, everybody. Take care and thanks for hanging in there with us. Go scream into your pillows now. <laughs> oh, I've been doing that. <laughs> we got to laugh or we'd never get out of bed. I'd be. Well, exactly. Exactly. You know, know. my situation and, and it's just uh, crazy making. So I know. Well, Thank you guys you. are the best part of this journey, I'll tell you. God bless. Okay. Bye -bye. I'm going to, I'm going to kill it for now. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye.